Okay, there we go. Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here and uh, since you guys have been asking, I wanted to try and do a JavaScript news podcast, I guess. Um, I mean, I guess it's, you're going to call it podcast. So basically, I'm going to go through the this week's news and have a look at what's cool there and give my opinion on most of the stuff. And uh, yeah, let's see how that goes. Basically, I again have this kind of ghetto set up with uh, stream chat right on the screen. I'm just going to be streaming my desktop because why the hell not? I probably should come up with a better way of doing it. Maybe just capture the um, Chrome window or something, but we're going to see how that goes. I think for the beginning, that's a, that's a fine setup. And if that goes well, we might as well do this weekly thing. So let's start with a bunch of um, emails I'm reading. Um, hi, Renato, how's it going? So yeah, as I said, let's start with a bunch of weekly emails that I am subscribed to. One of them is JavaScript Weekly. Hi, Finit TV. Uh, welcome to the stream. Right, let us start reading the news. So what do we have here? Don't adjust your sets. We've been tweaking. Oh, yeah, they have the new slightly new design, which is quite much cleaner. I do like that. And the first news is Webpack 4.0 released. That is not actually news to me. I've seen the announcement on Twitter already. There's been a lot of talks about it. And uh, it actually looks amazing. So I haven't tried it myself yet, but there is so many awesome improvements, including the speed, which is like 98% increase in speed is insane. Like, how do you do that? How do you pull that off? I guess there was a lot of uh, space for the um, uh, for improvements. Uh, they are now zero config JS thing. So basically there are no, there's no need to write any configs and it will work out of the box. Obviously, it will be better, you know, you can still customize it with the whole large uh, Webpack config, but uh, still, it's nice if you can just, you know, install Webpack and run it and it will work out of the box. Um, better split plugin, that is always great and welcome. They, ah, yeah, right, they have the baked in WebAssembly support now, which is really, really cool. So you can directly import Rust, C and C++ modules that will uh, transform via loaders to WebAssembly. I have yet to find a use case where I actually need WebAssembly, but admittedly, you know, I don't really work much with uh, CPU intensive operations or anything like that. It's like gaming is an obvious uh, area for that, for example. So that's pretty cool. Uh, they introduced MGS support and module types, uh, which is also great. I think the JavaScript auto is the default version, and then you can basically force whatever you want, common JS, AMD, um, ESM, whatever, you know. It's all nice and well. Um, HTML Webpack plugin, what is that? HTML, blah, blah, blah. For the release, we gave ecosystem a month to upgrade any plugins to loaders. Aha, so they have a new loaders API, which means some of the older plugins might be broken. Um, a patched fork of HTML. Okay, so this is basically one of the plugins that have not been updated, but they provided a fork with fixes. That is actually insane. Oh, and the plugin is updated. That's some solid work over here. Okay, um, blah, 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 whatever, emojis. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was quite a lot of people complaining on Twitter. I was like, why do you have so many emojis in the article about the VAP pack? I would pay for a plugin that will remove those emojis, which, I mean, I, you know, I'm not inherently against emojis, but I could say that there's a bit too many of them here, maybe. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, and the Windows 7 and older ones definitely show just a bunch of, crap instead of actual emojis. So it's a bit, a bit unfortunate. All right, yeah, so it's all great and, and stuff. Okay, let's see, Propel, a scientific computing framework for JavaScript, NumPy-like. Okay, that is very interesting. There was already one, right? I think there was the, what do you call it? There was the uh, Stdlib, I think it was. Um, wasn't it that standard library for JavaScript? I think this was the one, right? They had like a bunch of stuff um, I mean, mathematical functions, essentially, yeah, but I don't know how much overlap or how much difference is there between this and the std lib. Um, machine learning for JavaScript, okay, oh, oh, wait a second, I think I've heard about that uh, framework somewhere, let me make it slightly smaller so it fits on the screen. So there was the, the guys went nuts and used WebGL to actually do GPU computed uh, JavaScript Machine learning, essentially, yeah. So like gradient function and all that kind of stuff. Right. That is either that's a different 
library that does the same or is the one that I already saw before? Let's see the GitHub. I definitely want to start that. Um, doesn't look like I started that before, so it might be a new one, but it already has like thousand stars. That is, that's really cool. I need to look at that closer. That sounds really, really awesome. They don't seem to have any public demos, which is slightly disappointing. They do have a decent dog, it seems. So they have like German data set, line space, multi gradients, uh, ten oh, even tensors. Okay, that's interesting. Oh, right, they have tensors in JavaScript. Oh, okay, I'm I'm really curious how that will work. Okay, that's that's a re really cool one. I would need to look a bit closer at it. Let me just do this uh, bookmark bar. There we go. We'll have a look at that later. The future of JavaScript sponsored article. That's probably boring. Lost art of makefile. Um, sure, let's have a look. Not sure why I would want to use makefile when you have like Webpack and NPM scripts. Uh, but make files are quite useful if you have more complex things you want to do, right? I'm going to stick with Webpack. Why does JavaScript need a bit step? Introducing make file. Um, practical example. Okay, yeah, Babel. I mean, you can do that in um, npm scripts, and that wouldn't even require make file. The one problem with make files is that they don't work on Windows, for example. So even though I do like make files and you use them quite frequently for server stuff specifically, when we have projects that are built by multiple developers on various platforms, including Windows, you cannot really use make files that well because, well, I mean, okay, now in Windows you have the uh, WSL, the uh, Linux subsystem, but still it's kind of like, you know, a bit, a bit iffy and it's just Windows 10 specific. So, locating Babel, yeah, it's just like, this seems like a make file tutorial, yeah. So it's not, I wouldn't say that's like too helpful, but fine. In the loop, tour of event loop, that's a half an hour video from, oh, it's a new JS Confasia. Yeah, that's something I actually should probably have a look at the playlist they have here and uh, go through, oh, they have an Iceland one already, but not all videos are there, I guess. That is something I want to watch. So I try to watch, um, at least skim through the most of the videos from the conferences because there is typically, ah, God damn it, no. There's tip, what? I'm sorry, what? What? Get, wait, 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 what? This video contains, what the? Marilyn, ba what? <laughs> it's a JavaScript conference video, what the hell? Okay, then. Uh, so yes, I will have a look at this later on. Let me add it to bookmark bar because why the hell not? Um, yeah, as, as I said, I try to look through all the conference videos because sometimes you find really cool things there. And uh, I mean, some talks are just, like, yeah, some people who just repeat stuff over and over again over the years. And if you've seen the first talk, the new ones would be just like slight improvements over it. And um, I don't know if it's worth watching. I typically just watch the end where they add new stuff, you know, something like this, uh, but it's always interesting to look through it. I mean, this video is from Jake Archibald, who's really good and uh, typically writes and makes a very good presentations. Right, tracing from GS to DOM and back again with V8. So what is that about? That is a V8 project blog, which means it's probably gonna be very low level article. Um, debugging memory leaks in Chrome 66 just became much easier. Okay, trace the and snapshot C++ DOM objects and display all reachable DOM objects from JavaScript that are references. That sounds amazing, actually. That would make debugging the memory leaks related to the DOM so much easier. Okay, so you can get a content window, um, my debug events, remove iframe, okay. Uh, okay, so this is the simulation of the leak, which is basically un yeah, the uh, leaking listener that is not removed. And this is the class. Okay, so this is the hierarchy. And this is how the snapshot looks. Instructor. Uh, um, I think this is the old view, right? Leak from the Chrome. Yeah, this is the Chrome. -sig. This is what it currently looks like. And it's been like, like this for past whatever, seven, eight versions, even more, maybe. I don't actually remember. If they added anything new to that, how does the new one looks? Ooh, that looks fancy. Okay, that is really cool. I mean, I really like reading about the Chrome DevTools improvements because they are usually like crazy, crazy good. 
Okay, we are not interested in jobs. Let's see, articles and tutorials. Origin story of ESLint. Um, debug, GS hint. Okay, this is just like history stuff, not particularly interesting to me, but maybe you know, if that's your cup of uh, tea, just go ahead and read it. Sometimes it's kind of cool to read those, but I typically don't have that much time, unfortunately, I guess, for that. Um, unless I'm somewhere on the go, then I download a bunch of stuff and read it on my way. Okay, how to create accessible autocomplete component with Vue.js. Um, all right. Voice over. So this is most likely all about accessibility. This is a domain I have zero knowledge of. Like, okay, maybe not zero, but you know, like very little because I never had to deal with most of that stuff. So I try to follow like the best practices, but I honestly don't have any competence in this. So I, yeah, you would be better off reading this yourself. But that seems to be a pretty in-depth article, really cool. Really cool that there are articles like this because you know, if you hit a point where you need to do something like this, that means you can just Google it up as usual, which is great. TypeScript, JavaScript with superpowers. I mean, kinda with super protection powers, I would say, but uh, sure. Um, okay, yes, so yes, you can do that. Okay, it just seems to be introduction to TypeScript. Yeah, that's that's like a TypeScript tutorial with what is types and what is typing, which I mean, as I said more than one time already, TypeScript is amazing language, but I think it only makes sense on either really large projects or on projects that have uh, multiple um, levels of developers, right? If you have like if you have a projects where you only have like senior developers working and they are confident with their JavaScript skills. TypeScript is not very helpful because those guys are supposed to be good anyway, so they won't really need all this, you know, typing. But if you have a, <clears throat> I'm sorry, if you have a bunch of juniors who might screw up because they miss the types and stuff like this, then TypeScript is extremely helpful and definitely worth investing time into because I mean it does give you an uh, additional overhead of setting it up, adding the compilation step, and so on and so forth. So it's a bit, a bit of a hassle basically. Okay, another article about Webpack 4.0. Um, I don't know why, because we just read what's new in the official article, but fine. Ember's equivalent of React render props. Um, to be honest, I never worked with Ember. So I mean, I had like a look and poked around with it a bit, um, essentially in, hell, when the hell was it? Like three years ago, four years ago, when like all the, you know, new frameworks hype was out there. And I was like, okay, this Ember thing looks interesting. Let me have a look. But for some reason it didn't stick. So I ended up working with React anyway, and I don't really regret that decision. So I don't know, that's, I don't think this article is very useful for me. Okay, sponsored articles are boring. Um, you now have a section on videos and screencasts. So why is this thing, which is labeled video and not in there? I guess because it's a highlight, but uh, this just feels a bit weird. WebAssembly, what and what next? Uh, okay, we're not JavaScript pranks. Really annoying website. <laughs> I, you can just open any poorly engineered website and get annoyed immediately. That's not that hard actually. Speed measure plugin. Okay, I think I've, seen that already, but let's have a look anyway. Well, oh no, wait, that's a Webpack plugin, right? So this is something different. I saw the one that was working on the nodes, uh, the no new node hooks API, but this seems to be a Webpack based and it actually matters loaders time, which is really cool. So you can actually optimize your config quite a lot because you can see, ah, oh, okay. Does it just group them or how does it look? So this is this um, script loader and this is the CSS loader or style loader, I guess. But it's, yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool that you can see exactly which step does what. This is pretty neat. Where's the link to the GitHub? I need to start that, come on. Much better, blah, 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 give it a spin. NPM GitHub, there we go. Okay, I will start that, that looks interesting. Seems to be worth including in especially large projects to actually know what the hell's going on. Page draw, tool for modern, uh, turn sketch mockups in React apps. Um, as usual, you require 200 lines of JavaScript to actually render something on the first page. Please don't do that. Use server-side rendering if you need JavaScript. 
not that hard in this age and time. Uh, page raw, effortly, eff, bleh, effortly, what is wrong with me? Effortlessly turn mockups into functional code. Right, um, so is this like sketch as in the sketch app or is it something else? Um, yeah, it is sketch app. So it's a specifically thing for the sketch thingy, which is I think some designer tool for Mac, which I never worked with because I have no idea about design. <laughs> okay, but it's, it's cool that it exists. Prepack, uh, wasn't that thing not really new? Yes, it is a very old library, but or not library, I guess a tool, but it's pretty cool. So it basically does partial evaluation and rewrites your JavaScript to minimize the size and optimize the execution, which can result in some significant gains actually. They, they had a demo somewhere, try it out. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so, um, as you can see here, there's a Fibonacci function that calculates only in one place. It basically figures out that this code will only execute here and will not be used anywhere dynamically or whatever, and just calculates the result, which again could result in really cool and uh, small bundles. So it's a great tool from Facebook guys, and uh, you can use it in development pretty effectively. Viewcli is an old thing, so not interested. Basic scroll, parallax scrolling with CSS variables. Um, I that I'm gonna be honest with you. I hate parallax scrolling that relies on JavaScript because 90% of time it just screws things up. So let's see, code pen. Yes, let us see. Is it bad or is it actually not bad? That's the question. Um, I don't really want to log in. Can I just uh, nah, come on? God damn it! Can I just see the what? Okay, let me open it in an incognito window. Maybe that will work. Oh, I think that does. Okay, change view. Can I just see the full page? Thank you very much. And uh, okay, so this, yeah, like stuff happens. So what, how does the code looks? HTML, CSS, and you do have JavaScript that does the work. So I, I don't know. I. To be honest, I prefer like minimal styles where if, if it requires JavaScript to work for something like scrolling animations, I would rather leave it out. Yes, there is high chance that this will screw up everything, especially on mobile devices. So yeah, yeah. Flatbush, uh, fast static spatial index for 2D points and rectangles. Okay. That's a very specific tool that you might not never, uh, might not ever need actually. So, okay, you add rectangles and, uh, oh, you can actually, so yeah, it's, it's literally like rectangle indexing. So 2D indexing, right? Might be useful for maps, but uh, this is so niche that I don't know, like, unless I'm gonna be working on something that requires that, I don't know if I ever need something like this. Delighters JS, trigger CSS animation as page is scrolled. Um, uh, that falls under the same category. I mean, that doesn't seem to be terrible at least in this kind of look. The animations are CSS, right? So that means they are GPU accelerated and all nice and smooth, but here's the question. So what, what you typically wanna do is you wanna go to the, where's the performance I think, right? Uh, no, not performance, wait a second. Where's the, the throttling thing? I think, um, Show throttling, uh, devices, wait a second. Where's the CPU throttling? Is it here or not? No, this is the internet, right? Um, okay, let's try CPU. Um, processor, performance maybe, yes. No, this this performance monitor. Oh man, well, how do, oh, there you go, here's there. Okay, so let's slow down the CPU and try to do that. Um, as you can see, it's already staggering, right? So that's, and I mean, I have i7, so it's okay. I slowed it down six times, but I, nah, you know, I, I can do without fancy animations, but without like staggering UI, I think I'll take that a hit. TPJS, lightweight vanilla JS tooltip library. Mm. It's like, okay, 14 kilobytes to show a tooltip, but there is a tooltip. CSS, what was the name of it? 
Um, there was a balloon CSS. I used, I used something. I was like super tiny. I think it was balloon CSS. So basically pure CSS. You don't even need any JavaScript here. I think it was this one. Does it require JavaScript? No, it doesn't. So yeah, why would you go for JavaScript when you can go with CSS and you know, simplify thing? I guess maybe this has a bit more, um, bit more features to it, but I don't really see, don't really see any advantages over the CSS one. So yeah, again. File pond. Oh yeah, I've seen that yesterday, but haven't actually looked at it. Um, that was the upload thingy. You can upload, tap to cancel. Okay, that looks fancy. That is like, okay. Commercial license, GPL v3. Um, but <laughs> I'm always kind of amazed by the libraries that Slightly, I mean, you can have animations in CSS too, right? If you're like, if you're into that, you can code them yourself and they will be faster than JavaScript actually. So I don't, I wouldn't say that animations are, give you any advantage over the CSS version, right? Because you can implement them anyway. So, okay, I was saying, if you're on commercial websites, so, okay, so it's a dual license project which means that nobody will probably use that uh, aside from the open source projects. That is extremely tough in our age and time to actually try and sell something as dual license software, especially something like a file uploader. I mean, it does look fancy. I would give it that. But there are so many things that can replace it. And file API is actually so simple that I don't know if you need that unless you want to have a nice design right off the bat. But yeah. Okay, that us see Node Weekly. So that was the JavaScript news. Let's see the Node.js news. Pandora JS new Node Application Manager. Is that like PM thing? Uh, ready to boot, manageable, measurable, traceable Node.js Application Manager. Why is your website half empty? Is that because of the zoom level? Um, okay. Documentation introduce. Let's start with introduce, which leads me. Why do you have a website if you lead me to wiki anyway? <laughs> okay. What is Pandora exactly? Manageable. Standard management capabilities of application processes and basic services. Graceful online, offline. Intra process object proxying. What does it mean? Uh, measure. Okay. I think that is a uh, Junmaki. Thank you for the follow and welcome to the stream, I guess. Right, let's see. Uh, so we have that. I'm sorry, as I said, this is a ghetto setup. So I will have to look at the notifications as they come in. Otherwise, I wouldn't know what happened. <laughs> all right, detect slow transactions. Is it like all in one thing? Custom metrics? How do you use that? Okay, I got the idea. Get started. Get start. That's not how you spell it, but whatever. Start uh, the goal of him, blah, blah, blah. GUI dashboard installation in the Pandora minus G, Pandora safe, okay. Proc file. So I guess this is the config. Um, you need app, so this will generate the, okay, so it automatically forks or clusters the um, app that you pointed to. I guess the fork mode is just dump spawning of more processes in cluster will be using the uh, clustering from Node.js which I think only works for HTTP servers, right? So run Pandora, start Pandora dev, okay. Um, now here's the thing, GitHub. Question is, how exactly does it work? So I get the idea behind it, but I'm always interested in, uh, okay, this is some scripts. Where's the, is it in packages? Pandora, mm, command line, okay, that is a lot. Okay, this just seems to be a CLI thing. So there's uh, some hooks going on around. Patches for Pandora metrics and trace. Okay, so the hooks are what adds the metrics and trace utils. Okay, but they have specific adapters. Um, uh, no, copyleft licenses does not necessarily mean that you cannot commercialize. Um, there is an amazing website called TLDR Legal. And if I look at GPL v3, did I misspelled it? No, I didn't. Yes, uh, this is LGPL. This is GPL v3. You can basically quickly see uh, the summary here. 
But the thing is, you also have dual licensing where you can say, okay, for open source projects or, you know, for public projects, whatever, we have this license. And if you want to use us for commercial licenses, or if you there, I think there was like uh, dual licensing in the case. I don't remember what was the project, but there was the case where but they said, basically, you can use our software however you want, unless you're using it for military cases, then you cannot use it at all. So it's like, uh, I think it's, it's I, I'm not sure what's the legal name of it, but you can do that. And we did that with some of our more like high profile projects. Um, but basically, GPL3 allows commercial use as long as you follow the license, right? And and um, this is what you must do. And if you don't do that, you violate the license. So state the changes, disclose source. And uh, okay, this one doesn't actually require you to uh, backport the changes to the master and fixes. But basically disclosing source and stating the changes where you use that library within that project usually means no go for the legal departments of the companies working on the projects like this, right? So whenever you go to the um, uh, corporation, and tell them, hey, there's, you know, we're building this new project. We have this super cool tool that is GPL3 license. Can we use it in our project? And they will be like, no, no, you can't. So um, any, any copyleft licenses are a big red flag for any large corpse. But if the guy who released that uh, GPL3 license product provides commercial license, they will buy it. I mean, if it's worth it, obviously, but they will buy it right away because it's like, it's way better than for them than the GPU. Okay. Um, so yes, looking at that, they seem to have a specific hooks for specific libraries, which is a bit, so I guess basically if you want to see some metrics, you would have to either submit a pull request with the hooks or do it yourself doesn't seem to be scalable to me, but I guess they have a nice fancy UI and it also seems to be, oh, it's actually from Alibaba guys. They've actually been, the Alibaba workers have actually been publishing a lot of really cool open source stuff lately. They have like really, really great libraries. Some of them have pretty weird translations, I guess, because the, you know, they're not very well versed in, in English, which is absolutely fine. But uh, yeah, that's it's some really neat stuff here. Okay, Propel, we already seen that. Uh, Node v97, which I think I've seen that already. So they updated the libuv and um, initial support for node specific postmortem metadata. I have no idea what that means and I have no idea what this means as well. So we're gonna have a look. Okay, there's a bunch of fixes. That is all not interesting. So node internals postmortem metadata. What does it mean? Allowing debug tools to navigate some of the Node.js internal structures, giving more possibilities to developers doing postmortem debugging. Ah, that sounds interesting. One example of what can be achieved with the symbols added is a new command being developed for LL node, which prints information about handles and requests on the queue for the core dump file. Holy crap. Okay. That is amazing. That is really cool. All right, I yeah, that that will be very interesting to see what kind of projects will this result in once they add the complete thing in. So I, I guess this is just like initial steps, right? So though they have the metadata, but I guess maybe metadata is enough. It's interesting. All right, um, immediates to be unreft. I never use this ref and ref thing. I don't know what that does. Is there any explanation to that? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Let's see the file changes. Maybe there's a source code. So, okay. That's the documentation when called request, no GS event loop, not exit as long as the immediate is active. Uh, huh. Okay. So this is basically related to node event loop and process exiting. Uh, I always assumed it actually waited for, oh, so you can specifically say that exit, even if it's in there, so you can just unref it and then it will just die. Okay, I see, get the idea. Right, um, Lua, guide for Reddit, um, <laughs> Node.js weekly, Lua, guide for Reddit use, um, how is this? Okay, we'll just skip it. How to speed up CI builds with the new NPM CI command. Uh, that is indeed pretty cool one. Um, the If you did know the NPM release version 5.7, which, oh, whoops, which resulted in a bunch of people installing the non-released version and uh, <laughs> breaking their servers because for whatever reason they run NPM with sudo. Please don't do that. 
Uh, but they've added the npm ci command, which essentially installs stuff from log file only without building the hierarchy again from the scratch, which results in way faster builds. So if you are have any CI setup, you should replace the install with npm ci that will result in speed ups and uh, more, more reliable um, node dependency structure. That's what I'm trying to say. So more reliable tests, more reliable installs, and so on and so forth. Okay, I don't think there's anything else in here interesting. Um, IBM, Node.js Community Diagnostic Summit update. Okay, that is, IBM actually has been getting behind the Node.js a lot lately as well. So they have like a bunch of people working on some really cool projects there. And uh, that is, so that was like really summit and Seems like this is just an insight for the Node.js core team that working on the internal stuff, which is not something I'm willing to dive into right now. <laughs> okay, you got, oh yeah, we've seen that already. Um, NPM 5.7 fix. Okay, so <laughs> I guess this is the fix for the, for the breakage. Yeah, okay. Right, yeah, so yeah, exactly. This is the face you should be making if you see someone running NPM with sudo. This is like, just no, just don't do that. Like, you, there's a better ways of handling that. Okay, so they fixed it. Good to know. We don't care about jobs. The plan is to have runtime deprecation warning for buffer constructor node 10. Oh, yeah, they changed the way you construct buffers, right? Yeah, you now use buffer from instead of new buffer. But I don't think there's a major change. I mean, it's most likely will only affect the packages that uh, work with buffers directly. And I mean, it's really trivial to fix that. So um, again, if you are not familiar, there's a really cool thing called code mode from Facebook, which allows you to write automated rules for uh, swapping codes bits. So it's really, really easy to write a one tiny code mode and fix everything in your project. So I don't think that's a major problem. Uh, we got Mongo4, that's a sponsored thing. But yeah, they add the multi-document support and ACID transactions, which is kind of cool. I don't think anyone else did that before, um, at least not in the um, object-oriented databases. Building a Node WebSocket chat app with Socket.io and React. That's like a hundreds tutorial on that. Uh, but why not? It's always good to have a look. Do we have anything interesting here? They're just using socket.io. I'm guessing my scripts are blocked again, so I don't see any, uh, I click that. Thank you very much. Refresh that. Uh, what is this? Is This is a video that I don't really wanna see. Okay, um, socket.io, that really, that's all the codes. Okay. Um, I mean, if you use socket.io, you can literally build it in like 10 lines of code because it just does all the work for you. So I don't know. I guess it's a nice tutorial. Okay. Um, health checks and graceful shutdown for node apps. All right. What is this about? So yes, in case you didn't know, you can listen for the termination signals in node and do some stuff to clean the things up properly. Um, like, yeah, in this case, like closing connections, stopping servers. In most cases, that actually is not required because uh unless your server is writing something right you don't really care if connection terminates in a rude manner let's put it this way but if you are if you need this to be need to be sure that you know the server will actually shut down gracefully and won't break um scripts are always broken on medium sites and medium based i mean i if you've noticed i'm using this umatrix extension and i block literally everything so i only allow uh, first party scripts images css xhr and frames and then i allow rare scripts from like cdn js and from like jquery cdn and maybe some github but mostly I block all of that because cookies are used for tracking you, media is used for tracking you, scripts are used for tracking you. Some websites are perma-blocked because they track you and I don't really want them to track me. So I use ad or uBlock Origin for ad blocking and then this thing for blocking tracking. That's why, for example, YouTube never knows what to show me or rather not never knows what to show me, but rather shows me only what I wanna see, right? Because I can actually control what they know about me which is a great thing about it. But uh, the downside is it actually sometimes kills the embeds from Medium, Twitter, whatever. But you know, this is a small sacrifice I'm willing to take actually. Um, Facebook, um, 
Facebook does it through Amazon mostly. So I actually allow Amazon to uh, snoop on me whenever I'm browsing the Amazon itself. And most of the advertisements I see on Facebook are actually like, hey, you bought this thing on Amazon. Do you want to buy it again? <laughs> I was like, no, thank you. No. Okay. Um, let's see. Terminus. God Eddie. Um, wouldn't say I like the God Eddie as a service provider with all the crap they did in the past years, but uh, that's not related to the developers they have. So let's have a look at what they do. Okay, so they, you wrap, oh, so it's specifically for HTTP server. You wrap the server in this thing and then you have the health checks. So it basically checks for health as well. And then you can provide a sick, I'm, I don't really like, okay, I guess it's a nice simple abstraction for servers, but so instead of writing server stop, you will just wrap it, but I, I don't know. I mean, okay, let's, you know what, let's have a look at the code. I'm kind of curious. Do they do anything beyond sick term? Because it seems to be like a very, very small abstraction. And I'm not sure it's, it's kind of, okay. I mean, okay. It, it actually removes event listeners, but if you like, why would you need to clean up event listeners if you're closing the process anyway? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Decorate signal handler. Okay, so sync server stop, catch error, then signal shut down, terminus. Uh, yeah, it really seems they only listen to sync term and there's like a bunch of additional things. Um, okay, I guess. I mean, I guess they had a very specific case for that, but fine. Let us continue looking at other cool things. Securing your GraphQL API from malicious queries. Wait. GraphQL is vulnerable to malicious queries. Now that's news to me. I did not think you could, I mean, obviously there are, will be people who will find attack vectors using anything, including, <laughs> including GraphQL queries. So I am very curious. Let's see how that works. Size. Oh yeah, that's a good point. So by, by default, I guess there is no limit to size. You can just request something very big, large and complex and it will murderate the database. That's absolutely worth fighting. That's true query whitelisting, but uh, don't you really do that by default? I thought you have to whitelist the queries, otherwise they won't be working, right? You can never change any queries, only add new ones. We can only open API to the public. Depth limiting, yeah, though this is the same as the size limit essentially. Amount limiting, um, isn't it the same as the size limiting? Am I missing something? Was the size limiting naive approach? Oh, that's basically they tried just limiting the size first. Okay. Then they limited depth, then they limited the amounts, query cost analysis. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, another depth. Uh, so I think there's some embeds missing again. Let me allow all of that. Oh, there's some bits of codes here. Okay, so amount limiting, query cost analysis. Okay. Certain app specific queries that are neither too deep nor too many requests, but are still very expensive. All right, let's see if we can figure out why is it expensive. Query, evil query. <laughs> Good naming. Threads. So we got a thread with a um, specific ID. We got message connection, first hundred. We got first hundred participant. We got first hundred thread connection for each part. How is that not a complex query? Just requested three objects with nested fields with like hundreds of results for some of those fields. This is insane. This is not, not complex. Okay. Um, okay. Potentially it fetches tens of thousands of rec. Yeah. That's the thing, right? So this is still a large query, uh, query cost analysis. Why wait? So they tried to implement a query cost analysis. They, you know, it sounds like a lot of time for something very generic that you might not even use in your project. Uh, did they actually do that? Uh, two, four, so they took the modules that already do that. Okay. And cost directive. Okay. So there's actually cost directive that allow filtering by complexity. I mean, I would do a, you don't really need to analyze the whole query, right? So the naive approach would be to just say, Hey, if it's, there's more like than two integrated objects, then just die and don't allow fetching more than a hundred or no, hundred is still too much. Uh, 1 million complexity points rejected. <laughs> what the fuck? Um, 
Okay, so I guess, which one did they use in the end? We went with GraphQL cost analysis. It's really cool that there are modules like this. Uh, and it's really sad that it only has 71 stars. I'm gonna star it anyway. Um, GraphQL JS, okay. So you just wrap it around the, oh, it's a validation thing, okay. That's pretty neat that you can do that, but the question, how does it calculate the cost actually? Is it multipliers? Oh, so you can even put multipliers there. And, oh, you can adjust the complexity yourself. That's pretty neat. Okay, that's nice. That's a, that's a really cool thing. So I never thought about those kind of things about GraphQL, but it makes sense. I mean, if you run the complex queries like this, your database will be dead in, in seconds. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see, what did we secure in GraphQL? Efficiently snapshotting your single page apps with Puppeteer. I think we did that already. No, we, what, what did we use a Puppeteer for? I don't remember. But that is very simple, right? This, this is literally the example from the Puppeteer tutorial they have on the official page. So what do they... Let's create a Puppeteer factory because why? Why do people like making factories so much? Um, okay, I guess they do it for uh, generic. What is generic pool thing? Generic pooling library. I've no, no, this not pool. This generic pool. No, this not the one they use. Um, this one they is what they no what? Huh? Wait a second. Do they have a link to it? Generic pool. Um. Generic resource pooling for Node.js, okay. So, oh, okay, so it's a pattern from the generic pool thing. You can create a, f so you provide a factory and then you give an options. And my pool acquire. So basically it returns you some uh, client from the pool, right? That can do stuff. So it's a thing for parallelization, pooling resources. Yeah, that's that makes sense. Okay, that's why they made a factory that explains it. And uh, factory new page set viewport. Okay, so they configure the page and they just parallelize it and run the same thing, but in the pool. Okay, seems straightforward enough. Um, let's get chart image. Okay, they wait for the window. Root change complete. So they actually inject the changes to make it render, which is like. Why would you design your app this way? They got memoization going and uh, yeah, okay. That seems straightforward, nothing. So it's basically just using Puppeteer with a uh, pooling. How to build URL shortener with Node.js and MongoDB. Um, okay, uh, that sounds like something you would do in a half an hour, right? You take the URL, you hash it, you yes, create a new short URL from the hash and that's basically it. In this case, they use the scale grid because it's a scale grid tutorial, of course. <laughs> so you want an article that basically shills for a hosted MongoDB uh, in a form of tutorial and uses callbacks instead of promises in 2018. I mean, not that it's completely terrible, but come on, your code could be like three times simpler than this. <laughs> All right. That's not interesting. Um, Properly measuring HTTP request time with node. Okay, let's see. That sounds like interesting one. Request start time. And I mean, yeah, that's the naive approach, right? That's what you can do like stupidly. Um, time true. So they have actually, oh, they actually have a, a request. JS have an integrated time measuring mechanism, which is pretty neat. So elapsed. The actual time elapsed since queuing request. Okay. Uh, depending on the service, but wait, there, there's gonna be two requests here, right? So since they are queued, then unless he executes them at different times, if they're executed at the same time, it's kind of makes sense that one of them will be slower than the other one. Um. But this one is actually slower. So, okay, it looks like they are executed at different times. Okay. Um, I mean, okay, yeah, fine, sure. Obviously the integrated tools will always be better than whatever you can slap in with new date time. <laughs> Implementing microservice discovery in 100 lines of Node.js. 
That is a PDF. Okay, let's have a look at it. Um, I do want, by the way, if you're interested in Netflix, I already said it more than one time. Uh, no, sorry, if you're interested in microservices, do look at Netflix guys, uh, open source works and presentations because they are really good with microservices and they have some amazing stuff there. Um, there's nothing to do with that talk. My own, not Netflix. Okay. Uh, service discovery, buzzwords, microservices, front end. Okay, yes. So, other services talk to each other. How do they know where to send stuff? Yes, I know how that works. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, deploy independently, scale independently, survive individual failures, service discovery. Yes, yes, yes. There's a bunch of algorithms. Else checks. Um, Service. I mean, yeah, the stupidest way is to have a service registry, right? You will launch a service, service goes to registry and says, hey, I'm a new service, I'm here, this is my signature, this is my API, this is my config. That's like super stupid way of doing that. Client-side discovery, um, client module, so great service discoverer. Okay, Rasco registry, Redis, so it's Redis-based registry, okay. New node service, okay, you can do that. You can do, okay, yes, gets an IP address for some reason. I guess they use the REST services, right? So I do prefer using a message bus for this kind of stuff, but REST API is okay as well, why not? Okay. All right, all right. Uh, more pages, please. So you get the from the service and then you can talk directly. Okay, this seems very straightforward. So, but I guess if you are not familiar with all that, oh yeah, the, so the thing is the register basically in this case should handle the load balancing and health checks, right? So it gets a bit more complicated. Health status, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. So that's like, that's a pretty in-depth presentation on how to do that and that's the code. Easy mocking service versioning. I mean, this seems pretty solid. Okay, it's like ready stuff. And the question is, is there source code here? Yes, it is. That's pretty cool. I'll take that. That's seems to be pretty nice. Package JSON of new service module. Um, okay, so you use package JSON to define the rules for it. And then it regist auto registers itself in the service discovery, which sounds fine. Pretty neat. Okay, uh, machine learning from scratch. That's a video. That's a video. The bugger. <laughs> That's a great name. Debug a node process without inspect flags. Uh, how does that work? Okay. Oh, so it's just a thing that you basically that starts the debugger for you. But um, I like. Is it worth doing that instead of just providing one flag to node? Really. I guess I like it's probably does the same, right? Yeah, it's just does the debug options and inspector. Yeah, okay. I fine. You know what? Fine. I'll stick to my way of passing inspect flag. <laughs> Janeway curses based node console REPL. I think I've seen that already. Um Okay, that looks fancy actually. It's even clickable. Okay, that's really fancy. So it's uh, just a REPL. Okay. Pretty nice looking. If you're not liking uh, standard node REPL, you might as well go for that. Why not? Uh, J, uh, so core root, node-based HTTP reverse proxy server. Mm, don't think that's a, like maybe if you want to you typically have a better tools for that, right? Than writing one in Node.js. There's like Nginx and traffic and whatever, and they all do a better job and have probably have more flexible configs, but if you want something small, quick and light, you might go for that. But I'm guessing it doesn't have like caching and all that kind of stuff, right? And by the looks of it, it's relatively small. So I'm guessing, guessing no fancy things inside it. Um, guide, yeah, so it seems to be pretty bare bones. Okay, um, a series, uh, simple event sourcing in Node. I think I've heard that somewhere already and then let's open this one and close this one. All right, simple event sourcing in Node. I think I've had a look at that somewhere already. Maybe, maybe I just read the article somewhere else before, I, hell if I remember. Okay, so it's basically you can create event sources from stuff, which 
I can be useful in some cases, but uh, not something I typically work with, I guess. AWS API Gateway Log Parser. So another AWS tool. I am not really using AWS that much. We have most of our service hosted in-house and it's like self-configured, self-maintained. It is a lot of pain, but fortunately that's how it works. All right, there is Node Weekly updates that added some uh, new stuff. So there's a new Node version that is a minor patch, which did what? Not minor, it's a patch. Um, what is it actually changes? Where's the change log? That doesn't, no additional comments are, what? Oh, the new version was published due to a bad, no, oh, okay. So Mac OS installer was broken. Good thing I used uh, Homebrew to do that. That basically saves me a lot of pain. Meet my free local API server for your front-end adventures, written in Node.js. Okay, well, what is that? Earlier version, I create a free API service you can run locally using Docker. This API service can be used as data source for your front-end project. All necessary basic functions needed to learn or experiment, so it's a mock server, right? Am I getting that correctly? Good credentials, API DB. Um, You build a mock server and then you want me to set up a database. Um, right, dbeaver, that's uh, okay. I will <laughs> forgive that just for the name of that thing. What is that? Three universal SQL clients. Um, um, oh no, he actually he uses Docker component. Why do you download it? Why do you do that? It's actually on AWS. No, you know what? We don't have a GitHub, but I want to read that. I am not. Uh, how do I put it? I like if I cannot see it on GitHub and quickly figure out what the hell it does, I typically don't spend my time on it. Maybe that's a bad approach, but that's how I usually go. Don't blame me for that. How do, okay, we read that already. Mm, deploying a production Node Express Mongo up to AWS. As I said, I'm not very much into AWS. Serverless SMS hub. Um, okay, std lib. Is that a different std lib? Because I think it's a different one, right? There's this, this one, which is microservices. And then there's this one. Is it the same one or is it? Yeah, it is a different one. So there's two std libs in node world. One of them is a mathematical stuff. And the other one is microservices because why the hell not and they share the name okay then mm. okay this is just another advertisement article for saying hey you can quickly deploy your service in std lib without doing services well you can do the same with exaframe let me shill for my stuff and uh, you don't even have to pay for that you can just use your own server all right when to use cqrs Okay, what is this about? Um, I mean, yeah, okay, CQRS pattern, CQS, yes, 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 that's all good and stuff. Please don't tell me you're gonna use it within one app. Synchronous UIs, there is better ways of doing it, event sourcing, it seems to be just a theoretical article, which sounds boring. Uh, machine learning from scratch, okay, that was, it's a video I want to watch. I mean, okay, uh, da, 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 let me pause that. I will bookmark it and watch it later on because I am interested in that stuff and I want to see how it works. Okay, we are done with that. Um, we have some news from JavaScript daily. Maybe there's something that we missed here. Let's have a quick look. And unless you guys have any other articles that you want to discuss, um, we are basically, I don't really have, oh, I have WebOps Weekly. <laughs> Let me try that again. I have WebOps Weekly newsletter that is not strictly JavaScript, but something I read as well. So we might as well have a look at the um, WebOps stuff. Uh, it's always good to know what kind of technologies are there for service that can make your life easier, right? Uh, practical introduction to container terminology. That might be a good link to share with people who don't know uh, how containers work. From Red Hat guys, that's always great. Uh, container one one container image container engine background that is actually a huge ass thing okay that seems to be a nice background so they they explain was the they explain pretty much everything image format engine host registry that's pretty nice okay that's that's really neat 
I need to save that and send it to people who ask me what containers are. 36 way comparison of cloud CPUs versus bare metal. Okay, that's always interesting to see. Is there a good comprehensive chart? Page one introduction. Performance per dollar. This is exactly what I want to see. Um, I have a feeling something's not loading again because half of the stuff is blocked. Let me unblock that. Okay, so this is performance per dollar. Google is winning actually, that's surprising. I guess not that much, but uh, this is what, John the Ripper, okay. So if you wanna rip the passwords, you go to Google. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, open FMM narrow to D. I have no idea what this benchmark does. TTS IOD 3D renderer. So I guess this is the 3D rendering. Again, Google wins. Pretty cool, okay. Open SSL. This time around the Amazon AC. Okay, that's actually a pretty cool article. I probably should read it at some point. So uh, let me bookmark that. It's always really cool to see the comparison of those things because, um, you know, even though theoretically from the uh, sort of general perspective, let's put it this way, you look at the Google Cloud and Amazon Cloud and go like, you know, they look the same as maybe this is a bit cheaper, this is a bit more expensive, but in reality, they have a completely different hardware under the hood and might work entirely different and might be not fit for specific use cases. So it's always great to read articles like this to get reminded of that. Git leaks, check Git repositories and history for secret keys. Um, I would argue that not publishing secret keys is a better way, but uh, if you did that, that seems like a nice tool to, to have. And it can actually work on remote repositories as well, which is great. And it finds AWS keys, okay. That's a neat thing to have in a case something goes terribly wrong. And while DDoS has used new way to achieve unthinkable sizes. Sounds like a very hypey article. What do they mean? Attackers abuse memcached D to amplify volumes by a factor of 51,000. What the fuck? Wait. <laughs> okay, wait a second. How does that work? Now I'm interested. So spoofed IPs, yes. Legitimate responses, yes. Okay, UDP servers, okay. This is your typical DDoS, old school DDoS. Okay, so memcached. Um, where's an explanation of how that works? User report attack is abusing a previously obscure method that delivers 51,000 times the original size, making it biggest amplification method ever used in wild. Uh, so they use the memcache. So if you don't know, memcached is a caching database essentially that's used to speed up the websites typically. You can cache other results, obviously, it's just a database, but uh, it's just usually a front end in front of the data uh, websites. Uh, started using blah, blah, blah. Okay, officials uh, report. So where's the, how does the attack works? Exceptional large amplification factor, um, DDoS mitigation services, 9,000, blah, blah, blah. In the server, some of the biggest public no DDoS. Um, it's no, why do you never write how it works? Um, it's just a mistake. So basically, the servers were public and then they made something that made them to harness the huge attack potential. DDoSers send them a relatively small number of UDP based packets that have been manipulated to appear as if they were sent by intended target. The memcached servers respond by sending the target massive response. Okay, so the public memcached servers, which should not really be public, but uh, for some reason are, get a spoofed UDP packets that look like they come from the source, and then they reply to the source by sending a lot more crap that is actually not required to the source. Okay, that seems kind of straightforward. Um, this is a UDP. Is there a paper here or something that can just describe it properly? Is not, this is our Technic article, this is reported, Cloudflare, there you go. Um, maybe they have, spoofing capable attacker, mem crashed. They called it mem crashed. Gotta love the naming of those things. Okay, uh, okay, so the bandwidth, holy shit. 250 gigabytes per second from one request, what the fuck? 
This is insane just from one memcached. This is okay. This is if you have any memcached out there in their public, go make them private right now. This is crazy. Okay, fix up. Yeah, this is an easy fix. Why would you even run it on public address? It's like this is not something to do. Okay. Uh serverless application repository now available. I guess AWS is pushing further to be like one button deployment, so you can like now buy a complete app. Which is pretty cool, if you ask me, but uh yeah. Alright, yeah, that's that's a reasonable thing to do. Third party CSS is not safe. There was a JavaScript horse tweet about it that was said third party uh that was just CSS is not safe. Yes, that was the case. That was great. A CSS K logger thing, yeah. So trusting third party CSS is kind of something you should not do so easily, yeah. So it's basically might be just as dangerous as the third party JavaScript. Well, maybe not as dangerous, but still as there is basically viable attack vectors now. All right, um, jobs not interesting. Postgres 10 now supported on Amazon, whatever. Mesos will soon offer managed Kubernetes. Okay, Dropbox save almost 75 millions by building its own infrastructure. Okay, that's that's a lot of save, what? I guess the cloud infrastructure they were using was not well optimized. It's kind of interesting that you know the people preach cloud so much and then there's stories like this that say, hey, Dropbox just saved like almost 100 million just by building their own data center and hiring more people to manage it, um, which is kind of insane. On the other hand, there's Netflix who say they will never do that because they are happy with the cloud and it saves them a lot of pain, which, I mean, it's a bit weird. But they didn't leak passwords with K anonymity. Uh, is that the, uh, yeah, yeah. So the, I don't know if you follow that, but there's an, um, Really cool guy, Troy Hunt, and he has a really cool service called Have I Been Pound? And uh, he now released an API, Pound Passwords, where you can basically check if your password have been in a breach. And you can do that via API, and there's now like a bunch of people using this API to do a bunch of cool stuff, including verification. Uh, during the registration, I will just say, hey, your password has already been leaked, so maybe you shouldn't use it. And well, I mean, you should use password manager anyway, some password manager and generate random passwords with uh, good defaults. Typically set it to the maximum possible 100 passwords with uh, unpronounceable with everything included. Unfortunately, not all the websites allow that and some of them be like, 100 symbols is too much. And if you do that, screw you. So you sometimes have to do it like, you know, 20 symbols, 30 symbols, but still randomized passwords are better than whatever you can come up with. Right, Docker files for Python web apps, not interesting. Amazon Athena, Shopify, uh, or continuous uh, the sponsored. GraphQL solves the problem of sprawling architecture. Okay, that's interesting. Microservices, it's all about events. That sounds reasonable. Standalone Docker file and OCI compatible container image builder. Okay. Uh, gRPC curl, like curl, but for gRPC. Do I want that? No, I don't, I don't. I really don't. Um, GraphQL solves the problem of sprawling architecture for enterprise. There is everywhere. Um, I mean, is that just talks about having access to, yeah, so one gateway, bunch of backends. This is the most obvious advantage of GraphQL as I talked about it, I think, but yes, really, this article doesn't really add much more. Microservices, it's all about events. Uh, that's why you have event bus typically. Message bus, event bus, whatever. Apache Kafka. And that's exactly what they are talking about here. Okay, that's not interesting. And we got standalone daemonless unprivileged Docker file and OCI image. Be okay, that's interesting. So it takes a Docker image, Docker file and then build an image from it without requiring daemon and without requiring privileges. Now this is really, okay, wait a second. Let me open that in a new window. That is that is actually really, really cool. Okay, IDU, so there's the normal user, make image, uh, okay. Does it like mimics what Docker does, but without, that is so cool. That is actually really, really cool. 
and he did name his thing and uh, it's private so i'm not sure why but uh, whatever you actually get what do you get in, in the end you get where does it put it is it a file i guess it's a file right but this is really awesome like this is insane <laughs> some people do some crazy stuff and of course it's written in go okay this is i could see some uses for that but uh yeah all right i'm basically done with the news here there's nothing else um i really have to talk about so if you guys have anything else you want to decide uh discuss let's talk about it if not we can uh wrap it up here i guess and as usual do not forget to go to building x with js proposals and vote for your favorite proposals because i'm going to be selecting the next one on tuesday so also um so this stream was kind of experiment i guess so let me know if you liked it i will upload the vod to youtube so if you watch it on youtube feel free to leave a comment here uh let me know if you like it and if you want to see this weekly um it's i mean it's kind of interesting to you know just sit go through news and talk like this i would do that weekly because i do that anyway so why not do that on camera if you guys think that this is valuable for you we can do this we can turn this into a weekly thing essentially and i will play games on some other day because why the hell not yeah um so chat seems to be extremely quiet uh, let me have a quick look so yeah it doesn't seem like anyone want to say anything so i guess we're gonna wrap it up over here it was a nice hour of stream nice hour of javascript news thank you for watching have an awesome weekend and uh, i guess i see you next time bye